My name is Ed Yaw. I'm the president of the County College of Morris, and it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, town hall meeting uh, sponsored by Governor McGreevy. We're delighted to have the governor with us uh, this evening. Please uh, join me in welcoming him to uh, County College of Morris and to Morris County. Before I give him a more formal introduction, I just want to take care of a few housekeeping matters, if I could. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, announce that uh, this, these proceedings tonight are being broadcast on Channel 19, which is an educational access channel that's managed by County College of Morris. So we're delighted that people from uh, around the county are able to enjoy this, even though they're not able to be here with us in, in person. I did want to introduce uh, a few of our elected officials who are here tonight, as well as members of our Board of Trustees. First of all, delighted that uh, Senator Bob Martin is here tonight. Bob. I might add that uh, Bob is a former faculty member here at the college and uh, chairs the Senate uh, Education Committee, co-chairs the Senate Education Committee, so we're especially happy to have him here. Also, we have a number of our freeholders here tonight, uh, freeholder director John Murphy, a freeholder. I'm sure the elected officials will excuse me if I charge through this list because I want to make sure we have as much time as we can with the governor. Uh, freeholder uh, Douglas Cabana, freeholder Frank Dritzler, freeholder John Inglesino. I'd also like to introduce uh, members of the Board of Trustees of the County College of Morris who are here this evening. Our newly elected chair, uh, Roy Evans. Roy. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Philip Santiago, uh, Carol Harper, uh, Elaine Johnson, Jeffrey Advocate, Ted Colby, Sandra Geiger, Diane Pachudo, and Dr. Joseph Weisberg. Please join me in welcoming and thanking all of them. <laughs> it's very tempting to give a very uh, a uh, long and eloquent uh, promotion on the part of the County College of Morris and County Colleges in general. I'd not do that. You didn't come here to, to hear that tonight, but suffice it to say that uh, we're very grateful uh, for the support that uh, Governor McGreevy and the legislature have shown to County Colleges over the last several years. Continued this past year under very difficult uh, budgetary circumstances. We were, uh, as a sector, uh, granted uh, $5 million more in support, the only section of higher education given additional support. We're very grateful for that. We think that's symbolic of the job that we do on a statewide basis, but certainly here in Morris County, meeting the needs of the people uh, and providing economic uh, development for the, for the region. So we're very grateful for that. And now it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Governor McGreevy. Uh, he's known to all of you, some much better than others. Uh, he is a very distinguished uh, public servant, having served as mayor of Woodbridge, He's also stayed, served in the state legislature as an assembly person and as a, as a state senator. Uh, his uh, bio goes on and on. As a family person myself, I think I know he treasures, as I do, his family, his two young daughters, and his beautiful wife. And we're delighted to welcome to the County College of Morris and in Morris County, Governor Jim McGreevy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Could I ask us all to remain standing? And at this time, it's my great honor to call upon the New Jersey National Guard to post the colors. Now at this time, I'd ask us all to join in the Pledge of Allegiance to our nation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a round of applause for the New Jersey National Guard Color Guard? Thanks, and everybody please be seated. Thank you. And I'm proud to say as governor, the New Jersey National Guard responded to more interventions this year than at any time during the course of the New Jersey National Guard history, serving in Afghanistan and Europe, as well as throughout the state of New Jersey and the continental United States of America. If you could give them another round of applause. Well, I'd like to thank the president. And uh, most importantly, uh, we also have representatives, not only from the Board of Chosen Freeloaders, excuse me, freeholders, um, <laughs> But we also have representatives from uh, the County College of, of Morris, the Board of Trustees, if they could please stand. <laughs> if you just re introduce yourself, Elaine, so everybody can hear your name. Introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. And I also really want to thank um, Freeholder Director John Murphy. Um, you know, Murphy's a big shot Republican. I happen to represent, you know, the, the shanty, you know, lower middle class Irish, but I, I'm glad he's welcomed me up here. You know, and today is also we have a number of mayors. And again, I, I want to emphasize my appreciation for one of the great outstanding legislators, I believe, of state government in the state of New Jersey, a man of incredible integrity and st stature in our state Senate. I'm just honored to call him a friend, and he brings such great credit to Morris County in the state of New Jersey, Senator Robert Martin. Where's Bob? Where's Bob? And we have a number of the mayors that are here, being mayor of Woodbridge for 10 years. That's where the rubber hits the road. Could any of our mayors please stand up and introduce themselves? John. Great community, Randolph. Very good, John. Thank you, Mayor. Mimi. Thanks, Mimi. Larry. Thank you, Larry. Mayor. Thank you again. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks, Gene. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's all the mayors. Yeah. It was. And again, I just want to thank mayors because it's uh, the most important job in America. There's also. Um, at this time, um, I grew up in a uh, Marine Corps household, and uh, my dad was a DI, and part of the program that we had in Woodbridge was a Grateful Nation Remembers. It was the United States uh, Department of Defense program that recognized veterans, and the whole goal was to teach our children that the freedoms that we enjoy as Americans have a cost, and particularly in light of Veterans Day, and perhaps now more than ever in light of 9-11, it's a great opportunity. And at this time, it's a great honor for me to call upon Andrew Lennerman. Andrew? I'd just like to share this uh, with you a little bit about Andrew's background. Andrew Lennerman served as private first class in the United States Army as a pathfinder during World War II. His responsibility included the courageous assignment of literally going behind enemy lines and in efforts on behalf of the United States Army to secure intelligence and to identify landing zones for gliders, as well as fought in the invasion of Sicily and southern France. During the Battle of the Bulge, he was captured by Nazi Germans along with other prisoners. He was subsequently used for forced labor. In recognition of his outstanding military service, Mr. Lanneman was the recipient of several outstanding medals, including the Purple Heart, 
two bronze stars European campaign, the French Liberation Medal. In addition, upon his return to home, he continued to be an advocate for the veterans, particularly the VFW post 8096, active in veterans affairs, working to secure and assist those veterans during their time of need. On behalf of this state and nation, now therefore be resolved that I, James E. McGreevy, Governor of the State of New Jersey, do hereby recognize, commend the contributions of Mr. Andrew Letterman in the cause of this nation, and particularly these United States Army, for his selfless dedication, his courageous commitment to this nation, extended to him this day, the state of the New Jersey, this 14th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2002, and independence of these United States of America, 227th to a real American hero. accept this on behalf of the veterans in the hospitals and the one who did not return. And all those who helped me during the time of brain raising. Thanks. Congratulations. Uh, and now it's my great honor to call upon Andrew, I like your style. <laughs> Andrew says, do I have to stay here? No, Andrew, get out. <laughs> I got to stay here. I got two other, I got two other commitments. I He's got two other commitments. What time are you meeting your girlfriend? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> eh. Andrew, thank you. The Veterans Administration, Andrew, now covers Viagra, but no. Um, <laughs> and now um, I'd like to call upon Mayor John A. Palovitz. Mayor. The mayor is, um, he's got a great background not only served as corporal in the United States Army, a member of the G Battery, 97th Coast Artillery, stationed in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. He was present during the attack of the United States of America by Japanese forces on the seventh day of September, 1941, by Imperial Japanese forces. He was subsequently honorably discharged as sergeant in 1945. He's continued to be an active member of the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association as one of four remaining survivors of Pearl Harbor who currently live within Morris County. For his continuous patriotic and dedicated service to his community, the veterans community, and indeed to his local community as mayor, where he has faithfully represented his community and fought and aggressively advocated for veterans on behalf of the state of New Jersey, as governor of the state of New Jersey, we do hereby honor, commend, and pay tribute to Mayor John A. Palovitz for all that he has done for his courageous service to the United States and particularly the state of New Jersey. Thank you, John. First of all, I want to thank the governor for this honor and uh, the staff. I'd like to uh, also thank my family. And believe me, it's a great honor to serve the people. The little people make this country go. And you know that yourself. <laughs> I, I want to express my thanks once again, one and all. Have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. And I'd like to call forward uh, Carl Klingener. Thank you. 
Carl is um, a resident of Booton Township. He's been a paramedic for more than 13 years and currently in the mobile intensive care paramedic affiliated with Morristown Memorial Hospital, a tremendous facility. While on emergency call with other emergency personnel in September 2002, his squad received a second emergency call for a traffic accident. The squads then proceeded to split up. He went to the second emergency call where there was an overturned vehicle with three occupants. He arrived at the scene of the accident. One of the occupants was literally pinned under the vehicle. At that time, despite gasoline that was visibly leaking from the car and all over the victim, he began treating the victim until firemen were arrived to free the victim. Obviously, he did this at his own personal risk, but he understood his sacred oath, and he continues to serve as a model of service and commitment. And on behalf of the state of New Jersey, and in recognition of Morristown Memorial Hospital, but indeed the entirety of Morris County, and the state of New Jersey, we'd like to recognize and salute Carl J. Klingner for his heroic efforts, his dedication to professional standards, and most importantly, his willingness to place himself in harm's way in the service of another citizen, presented to him this day in the year of our Lord, 2002. Thank you. I share this award tonight with the other members of the public safety team that were there on June 24th, and I thank you very much. And I'd like to call Robert Bednarczyk forward. Thanks, Bob. You know, we've got to understand the importance of teachers in our lives. We had teachers who cared about us growing up and teachers who made sure that we could read. Part of the problem now in the state of New Jersey is that we have 700 grammar schools in the state of New Jersey where 30% of the children in third grade cannot read at or above third grade reading levels. It happens in rural, suburban, as well as urban New Jersey. And so part of it is understanding that it's the quality of classroom instruction that studies have shown makes the most discernible difference in the quality of learning. Bob has been a dedicated social studies teacher who has taught in Parsippany Troy Hill School to motivate students for these many past years. And he's been in the district for 37 of his 39 years of teaching. He was instrumental in organizing and participating in district-wide drug prevention program, also focusing on the Institute for Political and Legal Education at Parsippany High School to include activities such as the Model Congress, teaching young people how our democracy works, mock trial, providing for a greater understanding of our law and legal system, and community research. His dedication earned him the title of a Bell Scholar Award a listing in who's who among American teachers, and in 1987, he was named a national finalist in Nabisco's Century School program. He's been again and again recognized for his efforts in teaching democracy, American system of government, political science and history to the children of Morris County and the state of New Jersey, particularly for his excellence and commitment to professionalism on behalf of the state of New Jersey, we'd like to salute Robert, Robert Benetzerk, Benarsik, I'm better with the Irish names, Benarsik, <laughs> for his outstanding excellence and commitment to education and his dedication to the most important resource, our children. Thank you, Bob. Robert, I know, exactly. On behalf of on behalf of the thousands of people who daily walk into the lives of children in classrooms, I accept this um, proclamation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. And the last one is a young guy, Michael Klinger. Michael, get up here. Now, you know, one of the smartest guys in the state legislature is Bob Martin, and he's a, you know, big shot professor at Seton Hall Law School, and he's one of the guys, you know, crosses every T and dots every I. When I was in the state Senate with Bob, 
I also had to be mayor of Woodbridge, so I was more concerned about, you know, the potholes and, and whatever. Martin's one of these smart guys, and in fact, somebody once said, my old friend Tommy Devon there, there were three people standing around a pothole in, in Woodbridge, and I was there, and they were all singing happy birthday. So Devon pulls up and said, oh, is it the mayor's here? Is it the mayor's birthday? One of the guys from Public Works said, no, it's the third anniversary of this pothole. But, um, <laughs> But part of it is, is understanding excellence and academic achievement. And today we have such a, a young gentleman and understanding this is our future, this is our country. Michael is a sophomore at the County College of Morris and this is a great institution. And you need to understand where this County College rests nationally for its reputation for excellence and what it brings, the great credit it brings to the state of New Jersey. Michael has received an overall GPA of 4.0. He's also the County College of Morris student representatives serving, giving back to his community on the board of directors of the United Way. He also serves at Phi Theta Kappa, editor of public relations. He's involved in the newspaper. He's involved in literature. And he also volunteers, which is what I like, in Morristown for a great program, Phoenix House Foundation and Daytop, which is a therapeutic program for people battling substance abuse and trying to reclaim their lives. People from middle class communities, and it's a tremendous program. So Michael's got a 4-0. He gives up his time at the United Way. He's on the fancy Phi Theta Kappa, whatever that is. <laughs> I don't know what it is. He donates and volunteers at his time at Phoenix House, and on top of that, he understands the importance of maintaining a quality education. And I think it's so important we recognize young people who get it right, have the right values, and give back to America and their community. And Michael Klinger is one of those young men. Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor McGreevy. It's an honor. Uh, congratulations to all the other honorees tonight. Um, I receive this on behalf of the family and the friends who have uh, continued to support me and uh, make my studies possible. And uh, I want to say thank you to the faculty and the administration here at County College of Morris uh, for really pushing me and uh, continuing to present me with challenges and uh, just helping to train me and put me on the right path. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And what I'd like to do is um, talk a little bit about our budgetary problems and some of the problems we face, the state, and how we're grappling with them. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing in uh, Morris County and, and how not only your freeholders and John and your state legislative representatives are making things happen for you in terms of some of the investments we're doing on infrastructure as well as trying to improve or address outstanding problems in Morris County. So then we've got young Silvio here. He's from Vineland. Don't hold that against him. Um, start with that one first. Not just, yeah, what we do on the podium? Thanks. You know, part of it is, you know, when the state of New Jersey, we came into the budget, and again, and my dear friend Michael Bloomberg and I are getting a little tussle right now over something called a commuter tax, and um, yeah, yeah, whoa. And uh, we're going to push back, but it has a, a negative impact in terms of New York suburbs as well as to New Jersey, and so it's got a long way of going. And we're pushing back, and 48 states and 48 states in the nation. Um, there's Tony Chicatello here, big shot. Hey, Tony, why don't you stand up? Tony's one of these high-priced lobbyists. He's he's billing somebody tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, look at it, look at it. He's on Murphy's payroll. Um, but part of this is we've had a major correction in the economy. The NASDAQ has lost 40% of value. The New York Stock Exchange has lost $6 trillion of wealth. And in fact, right now, we see that the nation may be confronting or close to a recession. And on top of that, we were particularly hard hit by 9-11. 9-11 had an impact not only psychologically, but clearly also financially. Thank God for the automotive industry, 
and frankly, the low financing, which helped to maintain sales revenues. But part of the problem is that when we confronted, when we walked into office, we had at that time a $3 billion deficit. $3 billion deficit, and I came in in January of 2002, a $3 billion deficit for the rest of the fiscal year that went to July or June 30th of 2002, and then a $6 billion deficit for the year we're in. And basically what happened is government planned to spend $23 billion. We had revenues of 20.4, and we had a shortfall of 2.9. This isn't good. Go ahead, take that down. Yep. The next one, no, no, the next one. Part of it was is how New Jersey spent money. We were spending money way out of, way out of proportion to other states. This represents the national average and also the average of places like uh, Governor Pataki in New York, uh, Governor Schweiker and his predecessor uh, in Pennsylvania, and this is where New Jersey was. New Jersey was spending 5.1%. The red national average was 2.3%. So clearly we were outpacing the rest of the nation, not only in how much we were spending, but how quickly we were increasing our expenditures. Okay. Yes. That one right there. And this is the problem. I'm going to spend a, a few minutes on this. This is, and I pardon my back, this is the appropriation data between 1994 to 2002. This shows that state spending goes up, up, up. And the reality is, and I know this as a mayor, while mayors and freeholders were trying to control their spending, state government grew more rapidly than any other level of government in the state of New Jersey. You literally see between 1994 and 2002 an exponential growth in state government. And in 1980, state government was $4 billion, and in 2002, it's $23 billion passed. So state government literally exploded. Now, two points that I want to emphasize. What happens today is we've got a $23 billion plus budget. Bless you. 60% uh, of it is state aid to school districts and municipalities. $23 billion budget, 60% of it is state aid to school districts and municipalities. Every state operation, if you closed every state door in the state of New Jersey, that costs $4.7 billion. So you've got a $23 billion organization, 60% of it goes directly back to state aid to school districts and municipalities. You have a percentage that goes to finance state debt, then there's state grants to a whole wide range of areas. And then state operations itself, that only constitutes $4.7 billion. But now what happened in the state of New Jersey is the black indicates expenditures and the green indicates the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. What happened in the year 2000, we were roughly on target. We see that the Consumer Price Index rose in 1999 and 2000 and 2000. What then happens is, and this is where New Jersey made a mistake, is that New Jersey continues to spend exponentially. Remember, this is appropriation data. The, the state legislature and the governor appropriate, and then they expend. What happens is between 2000 and 2001, you begin to see a significant correction in the market. The market begins to level out you don't have the precipitous increase that you did between 99 and 2000. You start to have a leveling out of the economy. Unfortunately, at that time, the state does not begin to level out or make a, take a, undertake a correction in terms of expenditures. Instead, the state continues to expend. And in 2002, the Consumer Price Index takes a precipitous drop, and what happens is expenditures continue unparalleled. And that's when you create a $3 billion deficit for 02 and a $6 billion structural shortfall for 03. And this is now, again, I'm not dealing with debt. Here I'm talking about deficit. That's deficit spending in a single year. And part of what we did is 
in fiscal year 03, we try to curtail state spending and government spending. The point is, we had a legal obligation. State government can't go into a deficit the way the national government can. We're forbidden. I say thank God, because I think all government should balance the budget. But we balance the budget. But when you talk about problems, or frankly, and, and the president was nice enough to talk about how we increase funding to the, commu to the community colleges, I didn't do that everywhere. I had to make some cuts uh, in terms of some parts of higher ed. But the problem is here is the distinction between what happened in terms of the correction of the market and our continued spending. A classic case was economy.com, which is perhaps the premier econometric model in the nation, that of Pensy. They projected a 2.5% increase in capital gains. The state treasurer projected a 25 to 33% increase in capital gains. Well, it didn't happen. The whole world knew it wasn't going to happen. And so that's why we confronted a deficit. And we had not only the largest deficit in the history of the, of the state, but arguably, as against a $23 billion budget, the largest deficit in the history of the nation as against the operating budget. Thanks, Bill. Rich. Now, this is our problem. On top of deficit spending, and we've got to learn to live within our means. I could vote. I actually applied for this job. Um, this is our debt. This is in deficit year in and year out. This is hard debt. In 1992, the state debt was $4.8 billion. In 01, $18 billion. This is debt that all of us owe. And so again, you not only have the problem that we were spending too much on an annual basis, and our revenues weren't keeping pace, but then we borrowed and borrowed and borrowed, and this is where we're at. And so part of this also is we have a obligation, I have a legal obligation to pay for debt service. This is not discretionary. And so that I'm required by law to pay for debt service on an annual basis. And what's problematic is the percentage of our debt service is growing on an annual basis, but that has to be within our budget. Okay, thanks, so. Anybody have any questions on the budget? Yeah. Yeah. Where, where we had a marginal flexibility, we could, but much of it was fixed. Because that was how it was originally financed. No, 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 I, I get that. I, you know, if, if we, the state treasurer has already bundled and already looked to refinancing where we legally can. We clearly have done that. Sure. Uh, not for, no, not from all autonomous authorities. No, it does not. Like, that would not include uh, the financing for the school construction. That would not include the financing, all the financing through the State Economic Development Authority. Uh, no, but I could, I could get the number and get that back to you. Good question. Any, sure. Sure. So the qu the question is is what are you know what does it look like in terms of New Jersey in terms of our economy? We're actually blessed with a very strong, diversified economy. I mean, I go to these you know national governors associations. I just say, thank God that we have a we have a very strong, uh, whether it's pharma, biotech, whether it's telecom, financial services, computer sciences. Our economy though is undergoing a change. Last year, for the first time, we had a shift, particularly in terms of manufacturing. We now have fewer manufacturing jobs than the national average. Our future is in what I call innovation, the post-industrial economy, particularly in high end. And that's why places like this are so important, because one of the major critical concerns of industry is they need an educated technical workforce. And if they don't get it, they're going elsewhere. I was just with the Health Institute of, of New Jersey the former biotech companies, they're looking to increase the number of employees 
upwards to 80,000 within the next 15 years, their point is we can't get graduates who are technically proficient, who have skills in laboratory science, who have backgrounds in math and science, and Jim, governor, you've got to do something. So part of it is I think we've got a structurally good economy in terms of our industry. Where we do have concerns is obviously the financial markets. Um, and we worked aggressively, and to Governor Whitman's credit, Goldman Sachs is um, now in, in Jersey City. We have Merrill Lynch uh, in Mercer County. But what's happening is because of the performance of the market and the NASDAQ, capital gains where New Jersey is very heavily reliant, it's non-existent. So that means that we can't predict an increase. What we're looking at next year is probably more cuts in terms of state government. That percentage of $4.7 billion for state services, there are actually going to be more cuts. And part of what we're doing is we're merging the Turnpike and the Parkway. We have two authorities. I've got to merge them, but I've also got a half a billion dollars worth of debt, an easy pass, half a billion dollars of debt worth of emissions. And so part of that is I'm going to achieve those savings to pay down that debt, but most likely we're going to have to cut state government even further. Well, I mean, we're in that process right now with the state treasurer literally going line by line by line. In some areas, the state government will have to get out of certain businesses. I mean, it's not going to be a choice. Either there's certain areas that we're morally and ethically obliged to, you know, whether it's working with, you know, uh, the developmentally disabled, working in, in certain communities where only the state will provide those services. But in other services, frankly, we're going to have to discipline ourselves and make difficult decisions. Sure. Any other questions about it? Sure. Mayor? That's right, Rachel. Money, transferring money from the, it's on. From the uh, pension funds, because um, the pension funds are still relatively healthy. No. They are not. No. No, you will no. not transfer them? Uh, no, I cannot transfer, healthy. and no, they're not healthy. Okay. Uh, let me just tell you, we lost New Jersey pension fund and I got into a little skirmish uh, with the gentleman who was there. New Jersey Pension Fund lost $27 million, <laughs> billion dollars, $27 billion in 24 months. And so, I mean, this was going on. We came into office. I basically put together a committee of Governor Kane, Governor Byrne, and Professor Alan Blinder, uh, former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve from Princeton University. By the way, we, we do this great lecture series called The um, Spirit of Trenton and New Jersey Network. Just please, so my wife and I are the only people watching. Um, it's Blinders doing this lecture. He gave the most thoughtful, insightful lecture to the economy, on the national economy I've ever heard anyone give. Uh, so it's just not Bob and myself and Dina. I just, it's just on New Jersey Network, which is our public television station, so please support New Jersey Public Television. But the point being here is our pension system is in rough shape. We're going to make some changes. And so we can't divert money from the pension fund to the general revenue fund. The follow-up to that question, then, is at what point will we see that burden back upon the municipalities that we have had waived for the last several years? Um, well, right now, most likely, we're looking to stabilize the pension system. And that's uh, I'm going to wait back for the report from uh, Governor Kane and Governor Byrne and Professor Bliner, and they're going to talk about a long-term plan. But I don't expect any shift of responsibility now. Through 0304? Uh, through 0304, yes. But we clearly, I, I just can't allow the pension system to drop to the floor because we're losing such appreciable value so quickly. So we need to do business differently. Sure. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming out. Uh, you have my deepest sympathy regarding this Easy Pass fiasco. I mean, I'm sure it's given you more headaches than you can ever describe to us. Uh, I don't it's a great system, but it should work. And we used, I mean, it was driving me nuts. George, P Governor Pataki, with whom I've got a great working relationship, and I had a great working relationship with Mayor Bloomberg up until today. Um, uh, we're not going to go to the Olympics in 2012. Uh, not if he does the commuter tax. Uh, but part of it was they used... ACS, New York State, which is a proven contractor for EasyPass. We used WorldCom. They, they didn't have, I mean, seriously. We used somebody who was unproven. We used somebody that had 
historically a disastrous track record, we threw out WorldCom, and now we hired the contractor that Governor Pataki is using, ACS. And then just uh, simple things, why aren't the Easy Pass lanes the same place? I mean, why should this be, re uh, you know, so. Uh, no, Governor, I, I do have a, a question associated with that, though. Uh, I, I, again, I don't pretend to understand the Easy Pass and all the semantics to go along with it. Uh, as a former county road supervisor, I do understand the, the importance of, of uh, uh, getting people from point A to point B yeah. safely, economically, and, and lowering pollution, all that stuff. So my little personal point of view is regarding the parkway, I don't think we should have toll one on that thing. I think we should just let the economy go. Your economy in South Jersey moves north and south every day. You've got to let it go. But just briefly on Easy Pass, and again, from being a long-term government employee, I know this much, that when you get a service uh, on a government level and it doesn't work, you don't, first of all, you look to get your money back from it, and secondly, you certainly don't continue to pay for it. So that's, I, I wonder how, we, how we, 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 why we continue to pay for something that doesn't work. Now, what happened was, the premise of the former financing of Easy Pass was that based on the number of scuff laws, namely people who are going to maliciously drive through the easy pass lane without a transponder, without paying for easy pass, we were going to crack down and we were going to collect fines from bad apples to pay for the whole easy pass system. I mean, one, I think that's not a good theory of government premising irresponsible behavior as a financing mechanism for a transportation system, but I mean, I may be a little bit. So what happened is, as Easy Pass continued to grow and grow in popularity, we didn't keep pass, we didn't keep track with scuff laws. I mean, we needed more violators to finance the popularity of Easy Pass. I mean, if you accept the premise. And so what happened is the system went further and further in debt, so it went a half a billion dollars, $500 million in debt. And then on top of that, we negotiated with WorldCom and they were about to tank. And so basically what we did is we ended or we ceased our negotiations with WorldCom. They had a legitimate contract with the state of New Jersey and we entered into contracts with ACS. But my problem was the state of New Jersey, namely the Turnpike Authority and the Parkway Authority, still went into a half a billion dollars in debt, which wasn't WorldCom's problem, which is my problem now. And so that's why we're gonna be merging the Turnpike and the Parkway I wanted to put it to tearing down tolls. Well, now the reality is I have to put it to paying down easy pass debt. And then what I did is I asked people for a buck a month to pay down this $500 million debt. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to, and then on top of that, everybody was getting tickets and it was just a mess. We stopped that. We instituted a new system. And I think we're going to get there but it's obviously going to be a transitionary period that I think, God willing, will get done by 03. Sure. The battery on, on the transponder? Yeah, I, uh, my... My, I know I have a transponder. That's all I know about its, <laughs> I mean, workings. No, I've got the state police now. I don't get, no. Uh, uh, but no, but basically we try to correct, and we actually put into abeyance tickets uh, to, to stop that, and we're correcting the system. We're going to make Easy Pass work. In addition to that, we're going to go to high-speed Easy Pass, which 12 other states in the nation have where people can whip through within the speed limit um, <laughs> and, and not break. And basically, it's overhead. And so that if you have the transponder, you can move quickly and without, without any braking. And, and we're going to get that done. And we're going to introduce that gradually. But part of the problem is now is we've got to pay down the, the problems of Easy Pass and then move to a high-speed Easy Pass. Anything else on the budget? Sure. They don't commute every day. Will you keep the tokens? I don't think so. 
I mean, I, I was with you because I'm a token person and I was a token guy. But what happened was it's you've got to simplify. Simplify is good. I mean, if you give government th three wheels to interlock, I mean, we won't have, you know, you don't get a unicycle. You, you need to simplify, simplify, and simplify to make government work. And so if you have coins, tokens, and easy pass, I mean, we're beyond the breaking point. Um, we need American currency and easy pass, and basically they tell me that's where we should be. So the, I've got a token minion here with you and I, but I mean, it, it, we're not going to cut it, though. Sure. When you talk about um, the budget, I'd like to bring it right back here to Morris County, if I could, um, to a municipality such as mine. We've, we've had the Watershed Moratorium Offset Act cut. My municipality lost $300,000. I know that there are other municipalities in Morris County that that happened to. How do we rectify those type of situations? Well, part of it is, is the same way we did. I mean, that we had an early retirement program uh, between five to 6,000 state employees took the retirement program. We also provided for an opportunity to prioritize watershed. Not every municipality got, received what they did the previous year. I need to be very open with this. If we don't get the money in the state treasury, I cannot spend it. It's, and that's as simple and as basic and as honest as it comes. So my responsibility is I will not engage in deficit spending ever again. It's irresponsible and it's wrong. You can't do it. So I, I mean, you make tough priorities. This community college got more money. Certain municipalities, we held flat state aid to school districts and municipalities. The watershed, we consolidated it and made it more competitive. All that I can tell you is we have to impose fiscal discipline. It has an impact on our bond rating. It has an impact on our long-term long fiscal stability. And the reality is if the state of New Jersey is blessed with an increased growth in the NASDAQ and the exchange, and we have a turn in the economy, and God knows that Alan Greenspan's doing his job. But bottom line is, I cannot, as governor, spend money that the state treasury doesn't have. I would endorse first, I don't, my responsibility as governor is, I don't take bills, bill by bill by bill, because then I'd be nickel and dimed based on which bill came to my desk when. What I have to do is to step back and to view the budget as one document. And part of it is, is that you have to prioritize. And so again, we'll be making a formal budget document presentation, uh, probably, Bob, in February, March of this year, and we will look. Now part of it is, is do you have the numbers on Morris County? Right there. What we did is, uh, you, no, just do the, the ones. What we've done is on transportation investments. This is okay. Here, why don't you put it over here? So, what we've done is, <laughs> we're putting in uh, to the county uh, twenty-two million dollars worth of investments on road and infrastructure in fiscal year two thousand and three. And so, when you say, I mean, part of this is, is over the next four years, we're going to be placing into Morris County. $109 million of investments in road and infrastructure to free up or to address bottlenecks. We're doing this in cooperation with the freeholders, and we're doing this in the cooperation. And I just talked about 287-24, intersection improvements, uh, 4.9, Bruton and the Reservoir Bridge replacement, 7.9 million, Route 10 widening, a half a million, Route 46 improvements, Fairville, Montville 600, Sussex 617, Randolph 200. Just want to take the other one. 
And we're also looking at mass transit because we've got to understand the importance of preserving our quality of life. And but making, we're looking at um, obviously the 180 Roxbury, new buses. We're looking at new rail equipment for Morristown and Booten lines. The railroad bridge improvements on Far Hills, Parsippany, Troy Hills, Dover, Roxbury. We're doing re renovations of Morristown and Madison. And we're also proposing certain restored passenger rail service uh, to the area. And we're also very much aware of the fact, and I, some of you are aware of not only the prospect of the Secaucus transfer, but how we're trying to improve rail delivery. Thanks. So <laughs> what we've done is for Morris County, and again, I want to thank John and the freeholders and the county engineer, is that we're going to be investing over $100 million in infrastructure to make Morris County work. And so in addition to the school numbers, we're also investing, the state's also investing $44 million in schools in the state in Morris County. $44 million. So that's, that's $100 million in roads, $44 million in schools over the next four years. So again, this is, th these are infrastructure improvements that are long overdue. I had a town meeting in Morris County. I listened to where people are concerned. We're trying to work with the uh, freeholder board, working with the state legislators and some of the assemblymen. I also want to publicly recognize their efforts to try to improve s some of the infrastructure investments and the schools. So I think we're making investments but my obligation is to all the citizens of Morris County and to try to the greatest percentage possible to be equitable. Any other questions? Sure. Sure. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Mark, you, you can put that down. And just put up the other one. Right there. Go ahead. Why don't you ask your question? I said that uh, no one's <coughs> brought up the, ta the T word, the taxes. Um, and you, we obviously have a deficit, and I'm wondering, are you going to raise taxes? Uh, we did not last year raise the sales tax nor the income tax, and I am determined not to do it again this year. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Everybody know Larry Colasorto? Um, what we're going to have to do is, is make some difficult decisions um, in cutting government more in trying to consolidate services to the greatest degree possible. We also had the securitization of the tobacco funds. Uh, the state of New Jersey received a settlement from the tobacco companies. Last year, we used a percentage of those, that settlement to securitize it, to put it in the state treasury. We most likely will also have to do that again this year in order to balance our budget. Sure, gentleman in the back. Uh, Governor, one of the first things you did when you came into office was to initiate a plan called Smart Growth, the goal of which was to maintain the state plan. That's something that's extremely necessary for New Jersey, which is, in a way, the embodiment of suburban sprawl. Uh, and Morris County is a place where the rubber really hits the road, where we're seeing suburban sprawl uh, come up and sprout up just before our eyes. You're right. There's a watershed issue in this county right now uh, where a private institution, Del Barton School, is presenting something which the State Planning Commission has already declared violates the state plan, extending sewers into a planning area number five. With a powerful institution like that, and let me ask you a question, Governor. Guess who represents them? Guess who their lobbyist is? Who? Tony Ciccatello. Oh, he is being paid tonight. He's sitting next to Del Barton's lawyer and the head of their planning committee. John Murphy isn't paying for him to be here tonight. The question I wait, have wait, 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 let me just, let me just be back up. Let me just pay, look at, this is America. And it's a great country. And my responsibility is, is to do or to have government act appropriately, legally, and ethically. And let me just say, and I am the strongest proponent of smart growth in the world. I signed executive order number four, and they said, I'm not putting a darn red cent of any state dollars where it is in violation of the state plan. And I am committed the to that. Department wait, wait, wait. of Environmental Protection is backing down from its commitment to require the most stringent wastewater management plan because they're facing pressure 
from people like Tony Chicatello, who you recognize as one of the most powerful lobbyists in the state. Let me just be Is very clear. Is appropriate for everybody or for just people that don't okay. have lobbyists? No. You're not going to find him. <laughs> Clap for your own comments. Um, I got carried away, Your Honor. <laughs> Let me just say this. My commitment is to play it by the rules and to play it right. Right now, it's under review by the Department of Environmental Protection. It's under review right now by Brad Campbell. I am confident that we will provide for the most stringent review and to do what's right. In fact, he gave me this exhaustive memo. That's why I'm smart enough to hire people that are smarter than I am. Um, he gave me this exhaustive memo as to what's happening right now in terms of the review process, and I'll be glad to, to go over with you afterwards. But what Tony said is, I don't know, so but Tony said basically what they're doing is this, they're conducting a review of the request. It was evidently passed by the local, here it is. The municipality can't stand up to an institution like that, Governor. We're looking to the state to maintain the standards of the state plan. You're the one who's going to have to be. The, you're the one who's going to have to stick up for the state plan. And then basically, what we have is that um, Commissioner Campbell initially denied the Abbey's request to proceed with only a site-specific wastewater management plan, uh, holding that Morris Township. They required the township, uh, which it evidently did to adopt a required municipal wastewater management plan. Um, basically what happened is, is the state is presently reviewing uh, the system and the regulatory process. Why do you think they're backing down on that, your uh, governor? Who, why is who bought backing down on Why do you think the EP made that ruling after an exhaustive review by the attorney general and their own staff, and now they're backing down on it? Why do you think that is? Why are they I, I don't have the confidence. Their own, approved, sure. their own decision. I don't have, I don't have the confidence to, to fully express why or they did not did or did not make a decision. But it was my understanding that the the township evidently adopted the plan. The Morris Township adopted the plan, Your Honor. But this is a DEP issue. It's one uh, where the, this, the Del Barton made commitments in the past not to extend a sewer there, and it violates the state plan. We're not going to get a municipality to stand up for this. You have well, to stand up for sure. it. Let me just say that. I'd be glad to sit down, sir. I'd be glad to sit down with you and Commissioner Campbell. I would just respectfully suggest that Brad Campbell plays by the rules, and he also said both sides are likely to litigate. Um, <laughs> he said, but to act in accordance with the current DEP regulations designed to provide the environment. From what I, I gather is that I get sued by everybody. <laughs> I'm a guy from Woodbridge. Uh, let me just say that I think DEP has it under review. Again, I would suspect that Commissioner Campbell plays it right, plays it straight, and by the rules. And I am confident he will do that. Uh, let me be very clear. For 10 years as mayor of Woodbridge, I made $52,000 a year. I don't toss my credibility or my integrity for anyone or any person. I've asked Commissioner Campbell to play by the rules, to evaluate it. He presently has it. The township evidently passed this. Whether rightly or wrongly from your consideration, Campbell's responsibility is to make sure the regulatory process is abided by. And I'm proud of the fact one, on smart growth, we've taken the strongest stance of any administration in the past decade. On watershed protection, we've taken the strongest stance of any administration in the past decade. And also in terms of off-site pollution. So I would hope that Commissioner Campbell does what's right, regardless of who's involved on either side of the equation. Sure. 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 No, thanks. Go ahead. Hi, Governor. For, before I ask my question, the one thing I will uh, commend you on is being a parent of a uh, spinal cord injury 
my daughter has a spinal cord injury. Oh. Your work with spinal cord injuries is by far, uh, it's phenomenal. And Thanks. I commend you for that. So. Thanks. <laughs> and you know, let me just talk about, because it's an issue. This is an issue where somebody talked about our economy. And let me just plug my Rutgers restructuring for one second. We're going to keep the name Rutgers, 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 Rutgers. But, no, I, I look, but this is why it's so important. Right now in the state of New Jersey, we have UMDNJ, University of Medicine and Dentistry. It's in Newark, it's in New Brunswick, and it's Camp in Camden. We have Rutgers. It's in Newark, it's in New Brunswick, and it's in Camden. And we have NJIT, which is in Newark. Now, the crazy thing is, we have the Keck Center of Neuros Neuroscience, Neurological Scientific Research at Rutgers campus, where you have um, my dear friend Wise Young, who's doing groundbreaking research, and Dennis Troy, who's the Dr. Troy, who's from Merck Sharp and Dome Research Laboratories. They're at Rutgers. They don't talk to the people at Robert Wood Johnson University Medical School who are on the same campus. Then you've got the problem is, the most exciting research that's happening nationwide is cross-disciplinary, whether it's bioengineering, whether it's mathematics and biology and chemistry. And what ha what's happening now in the state of New Jersey, you have these three silos. You have UMDNJ, you have Rutgers, and you have NJIT. If the most exciting stuff is happening across disciplines, what we should do is merge campuses. Merge campuses is still going to be Rutgers. It's like the Cal model, UCAL at Berkeley, UCAL at San Diego. The whole goal is, is so that you have young kids in the undergraduate at Rutgers can talk to people from the medical school or the College of Physicians and Surgeons or the law school. We've got to start, we've got these artificial silos that coexist side by side, and we're not benefiting from working together on a campus by campus basis. And I spend time with all of these businesses. What's so crazy is we've got the strength of the pharmaceutical industry in the state of New Jersey. They are not doing clinical trials for new pharmaceutical products in New Jersey hospitals or with New Jersey medical schools because we have these false barriers. We need to understand the importance of this linkage and to have site-based school management so you have a world-class research-based university in Newark in New Brunswick and Camden, and so that we can work with the private sector. I think that's so critically important, and that's why I think this restructuring, people say, why are you doing this? Because if we're gonna be in the new economy, we've gotta bring Princeton in, we've gotta bring in Rutgers World Class, Stevens. You see what's happening up in Massachusetts with, Tu with Harvard, Tufts, MIT. You see what's happening in Research Triangle in terms of North Carolina with Duke and UNC, or the UCAL system in California, those businesses are going where they can partnership with research-based universities. We need to understand the importance of this. These companies aren't gonna continue to invest in New Jersey if A, they can't find workers who have the technical training, or B, they don't have the capacity to have partnerships with research-based university systems. This is critical to our economy. Because if manufacturing is gone, this is our future, and that's why I think it's so important. I took up your 20 minutes ago, I'm sorry. That's all right. It's not only critical to the economy, it's, it's critical, critical to the patient. Critical to the patient, right. Uh, now to the uh, not so nice part. <laughs> My name is Michael Sanchelli. I'm a councilman in Jefferson Township, sure. Lake, Lake Opacon. Sure. Um, I sent a letter to your office a little while back with a newspaper article printed in the Daily Record. Um, Part of the article said that I would go down to Trenton and grab you by the collar and bring you up to Lake Opaca on myself. I've actually been to Lake Opaca. I, well, we need you there again. You have a Lake Opaca on commission run by Mr. Feliciano and his uh, fabulous staff. And they're, they're doing great work with the lake in restoring it and infrastructure repairs. Yep. And we need your support for this lake. This is the largest man-made lake in the state of New Jersey. It is visited by thousands of people in the summertime and in the wintertime, for that matter. And we would like you to come up to Lake Apacon with our township council and our neighbors and tour the lake with Mr. Feliciano and his staff 
and see the work they're doing and hopefully get your support in their budget to continue the work that they're doing at the lake. And I would like you to respond. I, I, part of it is how we do it. And I think that's what's going to be incredibly important. I need a game plan. I mean, when, it, when I look to um, the lake, and I just want to say, my God, I never, so Morris County, like I know Morris County, it's a great place, whatever. It's like all of these, you know, I'm from Middlesex County. You got all these sidebar issues in Morris County, Lake Hapotkong. You know, they got the rail service. You've got, you know, and part of it is I looked at the, the problem is we need a game plan that we're going to adhere to on a year by year basis. And part of the problem is you're discussing a sizable expenditure. Bluntly, I cannot do that in any given single fiscal year. No, but what I can do is if we have a game plan that provides for a capital improvement which is incremental over the long term or to finance the debt service on a program over a 25 year period because that makes the project more financially manageable. And so, um, you know, when, if you have a 25 year, 30 year window, I can finance incremental debt service. The problem is, is the present proposal, frankly, knocks my socks off. Don't worry, you're not getting it. I know that. <laughs> but what I'm asking is. You did is, ask. What I, what I, well, actually, what I'm really asking is if it takes 25 years for this Lake Apac on Commission to get that lake But there needs wrong. to be a contribution Absolutely. from oh, the county. And the county is very helpful with this. No, 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 very no, no, helpful. no, no, no. Oh, I understand, a financial this, contribution. This, that, okay. yeah, that's what we're talking about. Well, I have to be careful with them because they, I work for them, so. That's exactly. <laughs> but that's okay. And, All right, but, but I, I mean, well, I need a game plan. I, I need your, we would like your support to initiate something that someday you're not gonna be the governor, okay? hopefully longer than you'd like it to be. But someday you're not gonna be the governor. And the next governor, we don't know who it is. And we don't want the next governor, we want some kind of an assurance that the next governor is not gonna ax this program. Well, that's what we're trying to do in our capital construction plans with our, with our transportation programs and DEP programs. Basically what we're saying is there's certain areas that are not, that shouldn't even be administration driven, let alone politically driven that are long-term investments in New Jersey that make sense for the quality of life. And so that's what we're trying to do on these transportation projects. When I talk about investing $100 million in transportation infrastructure, that, God willing, is over the next four years, provided you get the support of people like Senator Martin and the assembly persons who represent the district. So I'm willing, but it needs, with our financial situation, we need to work with the county as well as the municipality. And what they historically ask for is a substantial sum up front which I can't do. Yeah, I, I've been up, I can do it. I, I don't need to get up there to come up with a debt service plan, but I mean, what you, and I'd ask you to touch base with Karen Kaminsky, who's the chief of staff. Somebody over here. So, can you get that thing back up? My name yeah. is Doris Seaton, and I am a resident of Jefferson Township, and I am concerned not only about Lake Copatcon, but I am concerned about the destruction of the mountains and the woodlands and the rural areas in our township. I am concerned about my lake that I live on, Longwood Lake, which is being polluted by our county, and which we, we have had meetings with our county people. And I'm wondering what we can do to get cooperation between the local townships. Sure. And I, just it, to challenge Mr. Sancelli just for a second, he worked for, my, for uh, Morris County, and he is a councilman for Jefferson Township. Morris County is the one that's polluting Longwood Lake. So, I mean, we've got a lot of issues here, and I don't see how we can possibly get it while we're just politicizing an issue such as Lake Copatcon. It's the entire area that needs to be saved. We're, everybody's complaining about the bears. Well, why are, are the bears out of control? Because we're ripping down their lands and we're building on it. And on 15, <laughs> on Route 15, there are gonna be 4,200 Families moving in. You can't get on Route 15 from Berkshire Valley Road at 7 o'clock in the morning without waiting through five lights. And our lights on Berkshire Valley Road are about five minutes each. 
so I can't get out of Berkshire Valley Road to go to work to make my money to pay the taxes in Jefferson and pay the taxes from Morris yeah. County and pay the state because nobody's doing anything but blowing their own horn. Hey, what, what's your first name? Oh, what's your first name? What, what's your first name? Doris. Doris. I know your wife. What? Everybody knows somebody here, Morris County. Doris. Oh, she's doing that house. Hey, she's doing the hospital ball for Columbus. Now she's driving me nuts. Um, Doris. What we've done is, we've done a whole package, and I, I'm proud of the, sta the, the position we've taken on Sprawl. We've taken the toughest position on Sprawl, I mean, with the help of people like Bob Martin. What we've said is, is that we're going to enforce the state plan. The state is not going to put any resources into any area in terms of roads or sewer infrastructure that's not consistent with the state plan. And if a municipality is willing to challenge a developer, the Attorney General of the state of New Jersey will assist that municipality in trying to stop a developer when the municipality is acting in concert with the state plan. So we're trying to work with municipalities that are doing the right things. And in fact, I'm getting sued now by the South Jersey Builders Association because of what we're trying to do in Galloway Atlantic. In fact, they demonstrated on the steps of the Capitol against me because I was trying to stop development in certain areas. So my perspective is this. I mean, you do also have representatives from the, uh, the Environmental Law Clinic, uh, which is one of, the, one of the best in the nation. And what I'm asking you to do is, is get a hold of the commissioner, Brad Campbell, or Karen Kaminsky, where there are areas but you've got to work within the law. If there are areas that are in the state plan that are improperly being developed, we can toughen. We just toughened Category 1 standards for water. And we toughen them, Campbell toughen them to be the toughest standards in the nation. And so, I mean, what I just ask you to do is, Doris, if you get a hold of uh, Karen Kaminsky, she's chief of staff, and I've got this whole briefing paper on category one standards. If you'd be able to contact Karen Kaminsky to see what can we do to stop development. And let me just say this, Morris County, should not make the same mistakes that other parts of New Jersey have made in, in overdeveloping and not planning for thoughtful infrastructure because we'll be condemned by our own fate. This is an opportunity for smart growth, smart planning, maintaining open space. We're changing the, the focus of the open space program so that municipalities can buy open space downtown so that people can wheel their children downtown. And so we're trying to work very aggressively on this, and I just asked you to contact uh, Karen Kaminsky. Is so there somebody over here? And I really commend you for all the wonderful things that you're having for the future for this state. But at the same token, I'm very upset that you did have a lot of cuts in social services for the people that they really need, which is the elderly, the youth, and the children. So I would like to know that if you could slowly could re-implement whatever you took it away and from. And your first name is? Ruth. 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 Um, <laughs> the budget. No, no, no. I'm being honest with you. The budget is the budget is the budget. Yes. I have to have a balanced budget. Yes, I understand that part. But the thing is that we have people that they cannot Ruth, look we, we, those Ruth, things. we increase funding for those individuals taking care of the developmentally disabled. We increase funding for educational programs for autistic children. Somebody has got to make tough decisions. We increase fundings for those individuals facing sp sp uh, spinal degeneration. I I've tried to put it in programs that work, and God knows I'd love to do it all. But if I don't have the money, I have to have a balanced budget. That's my ethical obligation. Okay. Well, in the future, I hope you yeah. to that. If the economy changed, Ruth, sure regards to the state workers' compensation laws. I feel they're in favor of the corporations and the insurance companies and not necessarily the people. And I work in a very what, large- What's your name? Brenda Dooley. Brenda? Yes. Dooley name can't yes. be old. I work for a very large corporation, so I deal with this you know, from time to time and, and have personally experienced the laws. Is there anything that can be done to have someone look at the laws? And what, what's not working? 
workers' compensation laws. Yeah, but specifically. State. No, I'm um, like for instance, um, there is no time frames on when the the person can be treated to make decisions. They themselves cannot make decisions on the second opinion doctor, uh, according to law. Well, why don't I just ask you to contact Senator Martin, okay. uh, who's who, who's right here? But basically, if we would change workers' comp, it'd have to be changed through legislation. Okay. And um, I just ask you to speak to Bob afterwards. Sure, over here. Here's Jerry, right over there, right behind you. Uh, good evening, Governor. Thank you. I'm, I come from the great town of uh, Denville. I've been there uh, living for 24 years. Uh, I'm, I'm usually a Republican, but in 2001, I voted Democrat for you. So I'm happy. Yeah. I'm going to switch gears my way from Let's money. Let's not get carried away up here in Boston. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to switch gears. We've been talking about uh, money and taxes. My question deals with uh, basic... Uh, area of uh, humanity, uh, uh, fairness, and uh, uh, anti-bigotry uh, practices. Uh, you uh, mentioned your great respect and uh, admiration for Rutgers University. Sure. Uh, you may have watched last night on uh, NBC and CBS a uh, small uh, blimp on uh, a very offensive ad that was published in the Daily Targum, the official paper of the Rutgers University, with, with a circulation of 17,000. Uh, on November 4th, the student newspaper published a paid for, uh, advertisement by a group. Uh, essentially, the ad uh, is uh, a depiction of uh, two pictures. On one side saying, this is a picture of uh, a hero of the Palestinian people, and that picture is uh, that of a an armed person, and on the other side is, is a picture of an athlete, and it says, this is the hero of the Israeli children. And on the bottom says, well, there are two sides to the story, there's only one truth, and that is the Israeli truth. Uh, my people, uh, Arabs and Muslims of New Jersey, uh, take extreme displeasure at this ad. We find very offensive, defamatory, I will show it to you. On, 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 on. Sure. I have it with me here. Uh, we have tried uh, in a very kind and uh, diplomatic manner to approach the, the uh, editor of the newspaper, ask him to explain their stand. L let Can me, I have sir, it to you? Sir, yes. could, I, could I sit with you afterwards and well, look at it afterwards? I think everybody needs to know and see this ad. And I'm asking and pleading with you to please make an official statement denouncing this ad because it's very racist. It does not serve any good uh, well, let me just say discussion this. at all. Mean. I'm asking you to please consider it and denounce it as you did last month when you denounced Amir Baraka, who we don't have much control over for hiring or firing, but you did no, we're, we're make a moral statement. Fired. And here too, I know that you don't have the kind of control over Rutgers. Let but, me just say, but you do my practice is simply this. And I wanted to show this to everybody to see it, please. And, and I, I just think, um, the, the president also has shown great leadership to always, whenever there's a case of prejudice, whenever there's a case where somebody's being denigrated by virtue of their faith, by virtue of their race or ethnicity, to understand the importance as Americans to take a strong position against it. In fact, President Bush did it again today, and he ought to be applauded for it, because if that we're going to live in a successful democracy, People ought to be judged based on the content of their character and not other unrelated facts. And I've always taken that position, and God willing, I mean, my grandparents came to this country of Ireland. They were Catholics in the North, and they couldn't practice their faith. I understand the importance of taking a strong position. In the same way I took a position against Mr. Baraka, I will take the position of any time there is intolerance that's manifested in its way. And I think it's also my moral responsibility as governor. So thank you. Sure. 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 Um, I'm sure you are aware that there is a, a, a deepening and very critical availability crisis in the auto insurance market in New Jersey, and that's going to have negative impacts on every consumer and the economy. I was encouraged and applaud the views that you expressed uh, this morning earlier. You were there. The, yes, I was. Oh, good. This is an easy question for you, I guess, then. 
Uh, I, I do uh, uh, endorse the views that you expressed uh, at the Insurance Council of New Jersey meeting. And I, along with many, many others uh, in and out of the industry, look forward to your bill that you indicate you will be introducing in December. I'm cautiously optimistic that perhaps that will address some of the critical reform issues that we will need to fix this problem. Um, my question is, can you address that issue as well as what you will do to garner bipartisan support to uh, get that bill through the legislature? I appreciate it. God, I wish I had the speech with me. Um, you know, there's two basic problems. There's accessibility and there's affordability. Accessibility is New Jersey has the most confusing, bureaucratic, regulatory structure of any state in the nation. And let me say it's the responsibility and the fault of governors, both Democratic and Republican, because the regulatory structure in the state of New Jersey actually encourages bad behavior. Are we clapping for bad behavior or how bad the regular? But the point being is this. If a driver has three tickets, they are in the same tier as a driver with a clean record. We need to be rewarding good behavior and punishing bad behavior. I mean, this is like simple. Insurance companies are actually punished if they're cost efficient in delivering a service. So part of our entire regulatory structure is at odds with basic theories of capital markets. And whether somebody's a good driver, they ought to be rewarded. I wouldn't be in that good driver category. But the good drivers ought to be rewarded. And right now, there's actually a financial disincentive to cover the good driver as opposed to the bad driver, which is absurd. And so part of government on every level should be rewarding cost-effective good behavior that's consistent with capital markets. And then the other problem is we've got 600,000 people driving uninsured in the state of New Jersey. And I said simply this, if you're stopped by a cop and can't produce an auto insurance certificate within 24 hours, that car's got to get impounded. You know, people think I'm, like, people think I'm nuts. They think it's Giuliani-esque. My point is, you give it to the municipality, and I was a mayor, it doesn't work, you have to provide a financial incentive, people get capitalism. You give the municipality an incentive. So Mayor X, Larry, or Mimi can charge X number of dollars a day against that car, and after a certain amount of days, they can put the car on the block and sell the darn thing, and the municipality gets its revenue. But my frustration is, we've got a law now, and nobody enforces it. So either you're going to have a law requiring insurance, and you're going to make it enforced with all the respect. Let's not engage in the charade. And so part of it is going after the uninsured, and this is where I get everybody upset with me, and tackling fraud. If you commit a fraudulent act on insurance, and I hate to say this, all the you know, young college students, you're all in line, particularly guys first, who write down that you know, one of their buddies is going to drive the car, but really four guys in the frat are going to drive the car, or they're only going to go one mile, and the, the, what they're doing is they're taking the car 20 miles. The bottom line is they ought to get whacked. Because if you commit fraud, I mean, there has to be consequences for it, or else the system doesn't work. And I think it goes back, this guy's laughing over here. You're committing fraud, we can get investigated over here. But, what? Whack. <laughs> nah. When you grew up in Jack McGravy's household, you got whacked. Uh, but I think there've got to be consequences. I, you know, I don't mean whack in the, uh, exactly. Sure, no, exactly. Sure. Over here? Yeah, sure. I was so shocked you picked me, I almost fell over. Oh, no. Colleen Labow, um, Democratic Chairwoman, Mount Olive Township. Would you know Bud Lake well? You've sure. visited our fine Been lake. Bud Lake? Yes, but unfortunately, one of her little things got cut in your budget. Which is what? Um, I think it was a marital situation. It was a $100,000, $150,000 appropriation was cut. Both. We had a two, but I understand you'll get back to us on that. But my question is about with the insurance with the surcharge. When you were running for governor, um, of course, I was strongly 
out there pushing for you. And a couple people had a problem with um, the surcharge fee. Yeah. And a lot now of which surcharge, so we're clear? When, if there's an accident or a ticket, and then you have the surcharge, it goes on for three years. And um, I had one woman, a special woman, she like really constantly, she goes, that, that's, she goes, I just don't agree with it. She goes, because the burden of that surcharge usually falls on the parents, because it's a lot of times it's the college kids that will get hit with it, whatever. What is the reason behind having that for three years? Like, in, why should you have pay that surcharge for all those years for one mistake? I just, it seems excessive. Time to get the kid out of the house and give him a job and <laughs> fend for himself. No, now uh, you have a little one. Wait till your little one gets that age. It's not that easy. Exactly. It's incredible. I, I just, I'm just amazed. Everybody goes to college and thinks they can come back for a 10 year lease. <laughs> um, part of it is, is We've got to create, and then when I talk about the difference between good drivers and bad drivers and the surcharge, part of what the surcharge was attempting to be is to be responsive to the markets and to bad drivers. And we can do it different ways. We can do it by evaluating points as opposed to the surcharge, but that's one of the areas that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a point-driven system may be more honest, um, but then that's, it's got to be tied to something. It's got to mm -hmm. be tied to the behavior. So either you do a surcharge or you do a point-driven system, mm -hmm. and they both have their relatively, their strengths and their flaws. So that's okay. That's the only thing that's I under, Yeah, understand. that's exactly, that's one of the areas that we're reviewing. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, I'll get right over here to Mimi. I always get a Mimi. Sure. All right, in the back. We're going to get to the back. Hey, Governor, Governor. Boss. good evening. Uh, as you know, uh, I do a lot of traveling, and um, whenever I'm at a hotel, I always get a surcharge for hotel tax. And um, you also know probably that Morristown has been designated as one of the most influential uh, places to, uh, designated in the country by the American Heritage Foundation. That's partly because of the um, Morris County Tourism Commission. And yep, we do, doing a great job, by the way. We are, thank you. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, when I'm in Florida or California or even New York City, I get a 13, 14% surcharge for hotel taxes. And we uh, uh, have been funded uh, out of the generous budget of the freeholders and some of the other things that we do. What's your, what's your opinion of a 2 to 3% sales tax? I mean, for, for a hotel uh, and restaurant stay to support what could probably be a $30 billion industry uh, for I'm New Jersey. I'm picking up dimes right now. Uh, and I, I, that's I believe, actually I believe that with that budget, uh, Governor, you probably could use 30 or $40 billion. No, that's but also a very intelligent question. Let me just say, it's, it's, um, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness of the question. It's a major issue that's being debated right now um, in the state legislature. Uh, the governor's office, uh, we haven't taken a, uh, governor's council hasn't taken a, an official position as of yet. The state treasurer is under review both for the impact that it would have to the state as well as to the respective municipality. Let me just share what the concept is. If, say for example, Morristown, and obviously blessed with one of the great historic sites, um, I happen to be a, a Civil War fan as opposed to Revolutionary War, but then you know, you know, you go down to Princeton and they've, and, you know, crossroads of the American Revolution, Battle of Trenton, and those Hessian soldiers were drunk, uh, Washington crossed the Delaware and then Battle of Princeton. The thought is to allow municipalities to excise a hotel tax. And obviously that the proceeds from that tax would largely be borne. There aren't many people from Morristown staying overnight in Morristown hotels unless you've got a family wedding. Uh, that that percentage would go to the municipality and a percentage would go to the state. And it's an idea uh, that's presently in the state legislature. Let me just... And I, I was a mayor for 10 years, and I appreciate the sentiment, sentiment. We haven't taken an official position. As a matter of tax policy, generally, I do not think it is a good idea to have differentiating tax structures on a regional or city basis because it creates differentials in market performance. But I clearly understand that considering the state's present economic conditions, it may provide for a rational revenue mechanism for municipalities. And so I'm just going to wait until 
I mean, that's an excellent question. It's actually one that we've been talking about, but it's, it's one that's, that's under review, and, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness. I've got to take this guy right here. No, 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 no. I want to take your question. <laughs> My son and I um, are into off-road motorcycle riding. Sure. Okay, you just made a comment before about open space. Okay, Thanks. But What's your name, by the way? John. John, where are you from? Jefferson Township. Jefferson Township. Do you know Doris? Doris just clapped no. for you because you're from Jefferson. No. And what's your son's name? Christopher. Christopher. That's my nephew's name. My, my, cons my, my question to you is, um, a couple months ago, there was an accident in Trenton with an ATV. Yep. With a minor. Yep. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had an accident on Weldon Road in Jefferson Township with an ATV. We have no legal places to ride in the state of New Jersey. The only place we have is Chadsworth, which is down in Atlantic City. Okay, now, we've done so much with millions of acres, we're not allowed to utilize them. We have the old med the landfill in the Meadowlands, Sharkey's landfill in Parsippany, Combs landfill in Chester, Combs landfill in Randolph, sure. Mendham. We're not allowed to utilize it. Why is this? Well, the commissioner, Commissioner, commissioner Campbell. Commissioner Campbell raised the rate for getting caught riding in a state park from $200 to $1,000, thinking that, that that is going to deter people from riding in the state park. Well, his thought was is that they do damage to state parks. I'm right. just telling you. I, we went to New Hampshire on vacation. I spent $70 per bike to register the bike, each bike. Okay, that's an added. I'll go to New Hampshire and ride. If I'm going to spend $70 to ride, I'd rather ride here in my own home state. But the, qu the question becomes, and the reason why the commission... Jefferson people stick together. Um, the, the reason why I did it is because it, it, if you have a certain amount of usage, it frankly does significant damage. Yes, it does. But we also have riding trails for horses, snowmobile trails. Yeah, but horses don't, except for the, what they leave behind. Okay, snowmobile, but up, up within High Point State Park, you have, thousands, you have hundreds of miles of fire trails. Have you ever walked those trails? I, actually, I have. Can you get through on those trails? By foot? Do you think a 4x4 four four vehicle in the event of a forest fire can get through to those trails? Same thing with the Malon Dickerson Reservation? So, but you're basically talking about giving your availability to use these vehicles. Yes, everybody else uses them in our specific sport where you are not allowed to use them. Yeah. Even an old so. landfill. I know every landfill in the state of New well, Jersey. Look, I, I don't want to, I mean, it, it's a tough, it's a, Christopher wants to say something. Go ahead, Chris. We, the only place we can ride is up in Sussex, in Yamaha Express. Where? Yamaha yeah. Express. No railroad. No railroad. railroad sure. Let me. I, look. At, I understand what you're saying. And, and actually, this issue came to me, and I said, to, I said to Campbell. I mean, you know, I'm. I mean, I said, just do what you think is the right if, thing to if do. If you catch somebody for for a two hundred dollar fine, you think someone's going to stop for a thousand dollars? Two Rockaway Township Well, that's the whole goal. If we don't want they, you to do it, you raise the fine got, and stop. Two Rockaway Township police officers almost got killed on quads chasing guys on dirt bikes going through the... Uh, Listen, I don't want to... Uh, I'll take, Silvio, I'll, I'll take your name and address and let me talk to Campbell if there's a place where we could do it safely in this end of the state. The place is the Jungle Habitat. They knocked it down. For what reason, I have no idea. Is Jungle Habitat... That's not owned by the jungle state. Jungle Habitat's is. Western Western. Is, is that privately owned, though? State Green Acres. Oh, see, the problem is if you're doing one state Green Acres, you've got to be consistent. They're doing it down to Pine Barrens right now for uh, New Jersey off All right, let, let me, Silv, can you find out, sir? I don't want to make a commitment that I can't oh, no. keep, but let me, no, let me look. Uh, All right, let me get, let me get board, board Brad Campbell right over here. Oh, the guy's in the back. The guy right there in the, in the plaid shirt. Right there. What's your name? The road that I live on, Valley Road, is a 13-mile, uh, two-lane road that goes uh, through about five ta uh, towns, Millington, Gillette, Sterling, uh, sure. Berkeley Heights, and et cetera, all the way down to Summit. Now, the problem with this road is that... Now, whose road is that? Is that, our, is that the county's? As a county road, yes, sir. And all right, so just make sure you look at... Here he is over here. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> anyway, the problem is that 
it's not that it's a bad road. It's just that we need more than we need public transportation. I'm talking about bus public transportation on that road. Just let me take you on a little journey. Every time that I have to go to Newark Airport, I have these choices. I could I could get a neighbor to drive us. I could spend fifty dollars in car fare. <laughs> Excuse me. Let me okay. finish, please. I can I could park my car illegally at the at the train station uh, I mean uh, on the street or illegally at the train station for that time or I could get public tr I get uh, the Lakeland bus to take me to um, uh, actually those are my choices okay? okay I can only we can only do buses where the bus service pays for itself if you build it, they will come. No, 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 that's not true. No, that's the biggest hogwash store line well, in America. Well, well, how do we know? How do we know? How, how do we know? know? When, when are we? The, when are we going to get some service? I can't run a business like that. I can't run a government like this. I can only do where I have market demand. I understand. That's why I'm doing market demand in terms of repairing roads and working with the freeholders in terms of trying to Im Im improve the passenger traffic the on the rail lines. Like, the population in that area is, is going up and up. And, and our ability right. to you, get to the... So, get the gentleman's name and address. I'll tell you what, I, the best I can do is I will give you George Warrington, um, who is the head of New okay. Jersey Transit, will conduct a market study. If the market study supports it, yes. If it doesn't, no. That's sure. I, 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 have a, I have the mic for just one or just Well, wait, this poor guy was first. Go ahead. Bob Bells from... No. Thanks, Bob, Jerry. Bob Bells from Denville, New Jersey, and I have to address you on a quality of life issue for Morris County. Sure. I recently went to a meeting in Montclair, New Jersey, a month ago. Their Midtown Direct opened on September 30th. Right? I know. And it was a huge success. Tremendous. And they never blew the horn in Montclair at night. Since they had the Midtown Direct come through, they had the increase of trains, and sure. they blow the horn. So the people got up in arms. The politicians petitioned New Jersey Transit to do something about it. And George Warrington said he would put a limited ban from like 9 to 6. But he hasn't done anything about the buses on Wait a minute. And then they still complained. He got them back at a town meeting, and he says they will not blow the horn from 7 at night to 7 in the morning, Montclair has 11 grade crossings. All of Morris County has like nine. I've been fighting for seven years to try and not blow the horn at night. I can't get anywhere with him. Montclair got it done in one month. And I'm wondering why Essex County got such favorable treatment. I, do, I don't think George Washington is. And, uh, we, G we, George we get, Warrington. George, George He's a Warrington. nice guy. He came. He was very kind to the people. We can't get people to come for Denver, but just uh, like uh, your uh, PR people. I wish Mr. Warrington would come to Denver and talk right. to us. I, part of it is I don't know the situation that this is also some of it has to do with public safety and legitimate requirements. Honestly, but I think I'm saying Montclair has 30,000 people. Denver has 13,000. Three great crossings. Montclair has 11. And, and what, 30 what, days. I'm sure Warrington is not having them blow the horn just to bust your chops. No. I'm, no. I mean, no, we, we realize. Blow the horn! We're coming through! Just no, looking. actually, I'm here to ask for your help. All right. Why does Warrington, why are they blowing the horn? Because of safety crossings? Because, no, well, because it's great crossing. But we have the same gates. Everything's exactly the same. Exactly. I was down there. In fact, Montclair, the, the, the citizens group of Montclair asked me to come down to give them some support. If I was there for one meeting, I says, I need you to come up here and give me support. Because right. you got it done. All right. Um, why don't, yeah, with Silvio. Um, give, uh, first name is? Bob Bells, B-E-L-Z, Denver. B-E-L-Z. Um, give, so give uh, Mr. Bells, Warrington loves when I do this, uh, his number. And then I'm going to see Warrington uh, actually next week, and I'll follow up with him. I don't want to make a commitment. Because I don't know whether they're, everybody thinks they're Just like. Put a good word in for me. Right, put in a good word for Bells and the Denville Crossing. I'm blue. I can see Warrington. Quick, hit the horn. It's Bell's house. Okay, sure. And then I go go back. Go ahead, Leash. There's Booton and Morris line, and yep. that is true. And, and you, you jest about that, but that actually happened when there was a complaint. They actually blew that horn louder. 
Yeah. And there's a, there's a, there's an estimated over what is it a thousand a thousand whistles a day that you can hear as a resident because you have Mount Tabor and you have the two the two lines yeah, right I live there. in Woodbridge. I, I, but I, I, I live actually, next to trains. I like trains, but I hear you. I actually have a question. You were talking about fraud before. My insurance company, my medical insurance company, Oxford Insurance, is refusing to process my medical claim because they say For my auto or health. No, it's health. Okay. They're saying that I need the, the doctor's tax ID number. I'm in a PPO. Wait, you gotta go slower. All right. They're saying. Why do they need the doctor's tax ID? That's number? what I'm asking you. <laughs> I pay for the doctor up front. He does not accept insurance. He's not an approved provider of any insurance company. I pay him when I go to him. So you're in a managed care network? No, I'm a PPO where I can go to any you're doctor I choose. Provider. I don't believe in somebody telling me what doctor I can go to. So I go to a doctor and I pay him up front. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting to get reimbursed. Oxford is telling me I need the tax ID number. I went to the broker. And he's in, and he's in the provider network? No. He is out of a network. I pay myself. Okay, I, I pay I'm him myself. You. I submit my claim to Oxford, and they, they're refusing to process the claim. They're saying I All need right. the doctor's tax ID you know number. I, I don't know the answer. I, let me, um, I'm not getting reimbursed, and I'm caught I'll in the middle. I'll tell you to call. We've got a great commission of health. Uh, cardiologist Robert Wood Johnson. His name is Dr. Clifton Lacey. Call Donna Loisner, L-E-U-S-N-E-R. Yeah, and she's, do you know Donna? Oh, Donna's great. Call Donna Loisner at Department of Health and she'll follow up. Gentlemen, right Thank next to you. Thank you for hearing you. me. Hey, boss. Then I gotta come back. Hi, uh, my name is Norman Ressler. I live in Lake Apacong. Yes, Everson sir. Everson Township again. Um, that is for the present Can time. Can you just speak up a little louder, sir? That is for the present time, that better? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm a senior citizen, if you can't guess that. I've lived in New Jersey for 68 years. I've owned a house in Jefferson Township for 35 years. And now we're talking about putting sewers in. We're being told that we have to have them for um, anecdotal evidence. Wh like who's telling you that you have to have them? Well, wh I'm reading articles in the newspaper about it. But who, who is... Who's doing a study? Just leave the guy alone. Yeah. Okay. Can I continue, please, sir? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, we have a sewer advisory board that's packed with people who have a vested interest in seeing the sewer put in. Uh, I'm a little nervous about that. I'm not against sewers. However, there's the economic issue again, as we've been talking about all night here that if the sewers are put in, and I have an engineering background, I know a little bit about these things, it's going to effectively increase my taxes by about 50%. I'm therefore going to become a resident of Pennsylvania. I cannot afford to keep the house that I've worked all my life and to grow old in. What's your first name? Norman. Norm. by the way, do you use the senior citizen property tax freeze? Yes, I just no. got that. Homestead rebate? New Jersey saver, but you're using yeah. the senior citizen property tax freeze? Yes, I just God bless that. you. That's the most frustrating thing that I've seen as governor. We've got a great program that was supported on a bipartisan basis, Republicans and Democrats, for seniors, and we actually increase funding so that seniors, what's the income level, Bob? Under 48? Couples under 48? 47? Thanks, Larry. Couples under 47,000. Your, your taxes, the state pays the differential the difference between what you paid last year and this year. And I look at the numbers, and seniors aren't using this program. And, but I'm glad you are. What, what is it that you need for me to do to help you? Well, you brought up an interesting point. One of the reasons why I haven't gotten some of these programs earlier is I can't understand them to fill out the damn forms. That makes two of us. They, you have to be a Philadelphia lawyer yep. in order to do that. I'm with you 100%. And I tried, I sat down with, you know, I, just to so see my life, I sat down with the state treasurer, John McCormick, and he's a bright guy, CPA, MBA, only Irishman I know from Woodbridge who was a member of Mensa. Um, and I sat down with him, and all of these programs have different qualifying criteria. And I said, Mother of God, can't we do this simple? Can't we make this one program? They all have different qualifying criteria. They're based on different statutes and whatever. So. God willing, we're going to try to simplify, simplify um, in 04. But I just want to make sure you're using senior property tax freeze. 
on yeah. the sewers, what is it that you need? What I'm really concerned is, and I know about the tightness of funding from the state, that there's a projected cost, which we never seem to meet when we build public things, that's going to cost uh, an awful lot of money. And you're saying, Norm, you're not going to have the option of, of hooking in or not hooking in? No, that's not the, that's not the problem. This is the problem is, and unless we get some kind of state and or federal funding, it's going to cost me so much that I'm going to have to sell my house. Well, why? And, and they have to necessarily plow the sewer through your home? No, no. Just to hook up to it. I have go, to go ahead, just quickly. Norm, could she speak? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'll never have a sewer probably near my own home. Um, this feasibility studies to see, indeed, if it is warranted for our town, if it is something that is economically feasible. And if it's something that's going to come down the pike, it has to be reasonable for everyone to be able to afford it. So therefore, we are looking for funding through our state. In, in order to offset it with grants and with low interest loans. And it's not both. a done deal. And unfortunately, I think that's the power of the media that people believe it's already a done deal. It's something that's being looked at. Can you go around the, Norm's house? Um, it's going to go very close to it. But no, no, no. I have attended the sewer advisory council meeting. Right, Norm. I've seen the thing. Well, look, why don't we do this way? I'm not, I'm not going to. I, I'm not going to want to tie this. you up on it. No, 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 no. That's all right. That's what we get. Uh, whose district are you in? Are you in Bobby's? No. Boy. Oh. Boy, that was quick. Martin was like, I can't say that anywhere in New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, with Assemblyman Merck and, and, and Michael, why don't we discern? I can't make a commitment. Obviously, I, I don't know what the status of is, but maybe do, do you think it's possible that you could sit down with Norm and just review, Deb? Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm concerned about you know who's making the standards as to why we really need them. Yep. And uh, then I like to switch quickly to something else. Public transportation. I'm. I live four miles north of Route 80. Yeah. I live two miles west of Route 15. Yep. I cannot get out on either highway in the morning before 9.15, 9.30 without running into a parking lot. Yep. Okay. I'm involved. What do, you, what do you want, Norm? Okay. I'm treasurer of the Penn Jersey Rail Coalition, which is attempting to get the Lackawanna cutoff put back in business. And what we need from you is a commitment to sit down with Pennsylvania and get a operating agreement going. And that's the one thing that could prevent us from getting federal funding. Right, let me just, May. Um, the person who would make that decision, I mean, I know how to get on and get off trains. The purple person who make that decision would be George Warrington. We've spoken with him. And, he and what has Warrington said? He could care less about it. No, I'm sure he didn't say that. Well. <laughs> Except for the fact to blow the horn when he passes his house. This is a giant conspiracy here. Um, let me take your name and number, and I'll follow up with Warrington. Thank you. OK. I, I've got, and we promised the president. Where's that great president? Promised him we'd be out. Uh, he's gone. That says a lot. Um, we promised we'd be out of here by 9 o'clock. Sure, this guy in the back with a watch. OK. Um, my name's Peter, but just simply, my question is, a lot of money is spent on road construction. A majority of the money, as you indicated, is spent towards road construction. Road construction. The well, we're actually trying to change that, Peter. We are, but the 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 expenditures towards it are significant. They need to be invested in it. You had mentioned about potholes before. A lot of the municipalities and the counties fail to remember what how potholes start and where they go. And it was a suggestion by some people that maybe the state start to mandate. The funds, some of the funds that go to the municipalities and to some of the counties to mandate, say, 15, 20 percent towards, say, preventive maintenance. I was wondering if that's something. No, I mean, look, at I, I, was, I was nuts when I was mayor. I, I had a toll number to call them potholes, and I'd drive around the street and call them potholes, the public works guys. I'd like, I was the crazy guy when it snowed, I would follow them, and they were, they, God loved me. They loved me, but they also knew I was psychopathic about potholes and snow removal. <laughs> I mean, part of it is, is you should, you know, that's why you get mayors and that's why we have a great thing of democracy so that you vote. 
I'd hate to say that, that the state of New Jersey has to require a certain percentage, you know, to road maintenance. That should be the discretion of the public works director or the mayor. What town do you live in? I live in West Caldwell, Essex County. Uh, but I also reside in, in Whippin. Uh, it, this is just a... Ah, uh, no, get him! No. no it's just a, it, it's a common bond. The, Are you part of the Montclair Crossing conspiracy? No, no, no. no. All right. No, but it, they I don't got, allocate the money towards the no, You leave it up to the mayors. That's why you vote. If, you, if the mayor doesn't produce, you vote him out. This is America. I can't impose everything. God willing, the mayor is bright enough. God willing, exactly. And that's how it should happen. Well, that's actually not true. Actually, our unemployment is significantly below the national average. Okay, this is what I'm trying, let me just share with you what, what I'm trying to do. We just bought Bell Labs. Yeah. Thank you. We just b bought the state of New Jersey because the Bell Labs was going to be distributed to the four corners, four corners of, of, the, of the world, and I publicly want to express my appreciation to Congressman Rodney Freelingheisen, who did it. I mean, Who's actually, you know, Rodney Freeling Eisen also happens to be a de happens to be a decorated Vietnam vet, is a bright guy, and he's just a tr I'm. Wait, 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 miss, miss, miss. This, this is not how we do it. Um, <laughs> the, the, okay, okay, but I mean, Congressman Freeling Eisen, and I publicly want to express my gratitude to him, as well as to Senator Corzine. We received two million dollars from the feds. It would not have happened without Ronnie Freelingheisen and $2 million for the state of New Jersey. And again, I'd like to thank uh, Senator Martin for all of his help and, and cooperation. $4 million, we purchased Bell Labs. Now, part of the problem is, is we need to make this work. And we're working with NJIT to try to create a laboratory so that people and business and entrepreneurs have footing so they can use and they can work Bell Labs. What we're trying to do, let me just briefly, is look at three things. One, we're forming an Economic Development and Jobs Growth Commission. Uh, we're doing it with Roy Vagelos, former chairman of the board and chairman of University of Pennsylvania Board of Trustees, people like Art Ryan from Peru, um, a number of what I call graybeards, to look at long term how to make the right investments in New Jersey's economy and how do we stimulate investment. Second point is, we're also looking to the prospect of creating, we're scanning research-based universities and the private sector to understand how we can work cooperatively to make investments and apply technology to attract new businesses to the state of New Jersey. And the third thing we're working with the State Economic Development Authority, we're having them advertise a market so that we're creating these incubators, similar to the way Weldon did, Governor Weldon did in Massachusetts, or Governor Hunt did in North Carolina, that are based on university property, so young entrepreneurs don't have to spend their money on bricks and mortar. They can operate in these incubators and spend their money on research and development and to move intellectual property from the university to the private sector. Sure. Um, if one of our suggestions is, because we belong to Professional Services Group, which is, as you know, a state, um, funded agency for unemployed professionals in the state of New Jersey. It's a self-help group for professionals. Sure. I know, I'm familiar with it. And actually, workforce development, we, we funded and provided the funding. And you know what? They're excellent. I have to tell you, our facilitator, Amanda Young, can't say enough great things about yeah. her. One of, you have many executives on professionals in this group. As a think tank, we came up with some maybe suggestions that might help you. Um, what if we were to offer an incentive to corporations for that if they hire 10% more than their current workforce, we could give them the same write-downs that we do when they lay off. We, we actually do that. We have something called BEEP grants that actually finances expansion. And, and believe me, I mean, I work at this. I was just meeting with the president, with the CEO of Merck 
Um, I've, we're working with Hank McKinnell in terms of the Pfizer Pharmacia merger, so they expand research operations in the state of New Jersey. I mean, I, I, I've, I've been on the phone with the, the, the new chairperson of, of um, Lucent, so I'm working at it, but part of it is, is that expansion has to happen first. But we have a program that provides for tax benefits for expansions, and that's already there. In fact, it doesn't even require a 10% threshold. Well, I don't think it's working enough. Maybe we need to publicize it because our statistics are pretty poor. That Let me just tell that's I, New Jersey statistics aren't poor. New Jersey statistics, actually, if you look at the Council of Economic Indicators and you look at the United States Department of Labor, Department of Commerce, we're good. What we need to understand, and telecom isn't a reflection of the New Jersey economy. It's a reflection of what's happened on the NASDAQ and the exchange and whatever. But what we have to do is, when I talked about earlier about a research-based university and creating that partnership between the private sector, research triangle, and the state, I'm working on that. We created, not to spend a lot of time, we created Prosperity New Jersey. I've got Bill Weldon, the chairman of the board of Johnson & Johnson, Shirley Tillman, the president of Princeton University, there to focus on some of these high-tech, high-growth issues. This is what I spend a lot of time on, and we're working with these guys. But obviously what's happened on telecom with the NASDAQ, 40% of value, and the internet economy, we're trying to grapple with that, and I've offered to provide for help where we can on a regional basis. Because Mars County has, you know, as you know, was severely hit with Lucent and all of that, and whatever help you could give us, we oh, greatly appreciate and, it. And, and I'm there because I realize that this is our future, and I understand what you're saying, and we do offer beep grants and those opportunities. To, sure. Oh, oh, sorry. Then we'll go. My name is Ellen Pepin. I want to welcome you to the Highlands. Nobody said that so far tonight. And um, the issue here in the Highlands is water, both the quality yes. of it and the lack of it. I live in a town that literally ran out of water, and that's Roxbury right next door to uh, Randolph here. Um, I want to thank you for your efforts in trying to upgrade our streams and our rivers and our reservoirs. Um, and we're going to do more on Category 1. I want you to know that Commissioner Campbell, how many, this guy knows more than I do over here. What's your name? No, we just turned his head. What's your name? Bob? Bob? Uh, Bob, how many we've done? How many category one so far? Six. I thought I thought it was actually nine. But and then and then I know Brad is going to act. That is the toughest standards in the nation, and we've got to understand what people have got to understand. If we can't allow people to compromise our watershed or water, this is our drinking supplies. This is basic. We've got to get this right. We got to get it right, and there are developments going on five miles from here where they want to put 760 townhouses on top of an aquifer. Uh, at the, up the top of a hill drains down into an aquifer, which is, drains into the uh, Black River. And, and is the, and is the, the town opposed the, to this? I'm sorry? Is the town opposed to this? What town is this? Uh, Mine Hill. Is the town opposed to it? Um, some of them are. But let, let me just say, your first name again? Ellen. Ellen. Let me just say the problem is this. When a town acts responsibly, we can clearly support that town vigorously in stopping development. The law says I can, and I have as governor said, the state must act in concert with the state plan. I've done that. Before DOT would plow through roads, would build buildings, where it wasn't consistent with the state plan. Today, as governor, I do not have the statutory authority to say, town, you're acting in violation of the state plan. I do, as governor, I don't have I, I can make sure that. the state abides by the state plan, but all that I am saying is, and there are great organizations um, that work as advocacy institutions, if a town works in concert with the state plan and stops the developer and the developer sues, we will support the development we will support the developer in blocking that development. But the, the critical point is, is the town has to act in concert. Okay. Um, I, I'm not real, I don't live in Mine Hill, and I really don't, I'm not privy okay. to, um, to what the town fathers sure. are thinking. Um, hearings are going on at the present time. But my point is uh, a little more generic. I think sure. the, um, 
the measures that you've put in effect are, are great ones, it needs to be expanded. Okay, Alan, expanded. let me just tell you, on Category 1 rivers, we are going to expand more rapidly across the state of New Jersey to protect our water supplies. There can be nothing more basic than clean water and clean air. And we need to get this right, because once we desecrate those waterways, they are destroyed. You can provide for remediation. We've, we're stopping building on watershed. We're purchasing open space now. I've targeted ag adjacent to reservoirs to call that off limits for development. So you're talking to the converted. Okay, uh, and our, our freeholders have done a great job in trying to preserve open space in this county, but this county is has really um, gone to the dogs. I grew up right here in Randolph, and I can tell you, 40 years ago, it was a lot different than it is now. Well, I mean, the only thing that I can say, Ellen, is look at one, you've got to stay in there fighting, because if you don't fight, it, thank you, nobody will. And the second right. thing is, Ultimately, I think we should plan, and I know this is heresy, I think we should plan on a regional basis. Absolutely. As opposed to town by town by town basis. <laughs> but, but, but I mean, that ultimately has to be di decided by the state legislature. I've done as governor to make sure the state acts, but ultimately we need to change the way. If we're serious about smart growth, and we're serious about preserving open space, and targeting infrastructure, we've got to realize that borders based on municipal lines are artificial, they don't work, and particularly in terms of the property tax chase, it doesn't provide for sensible planning. Ultimately, I look at states, I had Governor Glenn Denning of Maryland. I think Maryland plans on a regional basis. Uh, it provides for more sensible vision and more aggressive protection of smart growth principles. Well, I, I, look, at, I, I support that vision, and I think if we're serious about smart growth, we need to do it on a county basis. We need to do it on a regional basis, and that's how we can protect our quality of life. And I'm there. I just, it's, what time is it now? 9.20, thank you. I, I uh, thank you. Time to, uh, President's got overtime concerns. Um, sure, this guy, last guy right here, this guy's been so, <clears throat> yeah, my name is Dr. Bonder, I'm president of the County Medical Society. I was wondering what plans you might have for this on a state level for the impending medical crisis, which is going to be coming sure. down the road in a short period of time. Um, let, me, let me talk a little bit about MedMal and, and some of the problems. Part of the problem is, is that one, um, the mix problem, I don't know if you're familiar with I'm it. Very, very familiar. I mean, the bottom line is they made a bad decision. Uh, mix was a private insurance company that was operated in conjunction with the New Jersey Medical Society. They had a tremendous problem. They had a tremendous product, but then they began to taking it to outside of New Jersey. They actually got tried to get too aggressive with the market. Then the market went south. They took the company public, and now they're paying the losses on it. So the name of the game is one prudence and operate rationally. What we're looking at now is, is particularly for the two areas of um, OBGYNs and uh, Neuro neurologist looking at neurosurgeons neurosurgeons thank you um, neurosurgeons and OBGYNs is expanding the risk capacity um, to provide for to grapple with the rates what we've done is form with um, Dr. Cliff Lacey who's the Commissioner of Health and Dr. Holly Bakke they're coming back with recommendations to me by mid-December okay, we've uh, uh, as part of the New Jersey Medical Society we've met with Holly Bakke and the impression we get from Holly Bakke is that as long as there is malpractice insurance, whether it's affordable or not, there's going to be no crisis. And I can tell you for a fact, from talking to hundreds of physicians, that there is going to be a crisis. People are not going to ha have their physicians. They will well, not that, have their... That's not what Holly Bakke... I actually met with her last well, I hope two days ago on this. Cause no, I mean, obviously we've got to grapple with this crisis, and particularly in terms of OBGYNs, it's frankly easier to drop your, you know, the obstetric side of the business and continue to practice as a gynecologist, watch your premiums drop precipitously. And, and, and I'm well aware of that. But it's not just OBGYN. It's every single specialty. Thoracic surgery, general surgery. And, but we're focusing on the two highest premiums right now. And I think it's very simplistic to blame this actually on the mixed catastrophe. No, I, di I didn't, no, no, I didn't say that, doctor. Okay. I, 
be clear on what I said. I said that exacerbated the crisis, and it clearly did. Absolutely. Okay. But, but there I is mean, a part of it is that was motivated by greed. Well, greed is not a good thing. Frankly, people uh, were insuring doctors in New Jersey. They were doing a great job. They they started expanding. They took the company public. A lot of people made a lot of money, and then all of a sudden, when the market tanked, insurance rates came up. Yeah, but once again, it's multifactorial. Well, I, I mean, it's not just the fact that they were. I greedy. agree with you, but I like to be. But the bottom line is the people in this room will not have physicians unless the state does uh, something. My brother-in-law is a physician. I, 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 I understand the problem. We're coming, trying to create a long term, and we're trying to work with Mix to, to provide for structured rates. I just met with Dr. Ruggiero, uh, Dr. Rigolosi, who is the president of I'll, the Medical I'll, I'll Society. Be him, I'll be seeing him Sunday. And Dr. Rigolosi has provided great, valuable input. And so we're trying to reconfigure both Mix we're trying to, frankly, find a way so that they can incrementally become on more solid financial footing, and we're working cooperatively with the Commission of Banking Insurance and also tackle the larger question of medical mal. I appreciate the fact that you understand the no, problem. I, 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 my brother-in-law calls it mangled care. Okay. So let me just, uh, let me just, doctor, let me just conclude. One, I'm not going anywhere, but I did promise uh, the good president that we would end by 9 o'clock, and I apologize for being over. Well, let me just say also thank you um, for being out here. This is a great example. And to the freeholders, to the senators, to the assembly, to the mayors, to most importantly the citizens, this is how our forefathers envisioned American democracy in, in terms of citizen town meetings. And I do them once a month. I did it every month as mayor of Woodbridge, whether we had five people turn out or 200. But I sincerely... I'm old-fashioned. I believe we live in the greatest nation in the world. Warren Buffett said if you're born in America or you live in America, you've already won the lottery. But it needs to understand it's caring passionately about the quality of our democracy, the quality of our community, so that we raise our children and we live, leave this state and nation stronger, more viable. I just want to say thank you simply for caring. It's in the best tradition of American government. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to go to the door.